Hello, and welcome to the Business Behind Small Business, the show that reminds you that just because you own a business doesn't mean you are a business owner. In each episode, we will discuss a common issue small businesses face and offer tips and advice from the perspectives of two business owners, one that built to sell and one that built to inherit. We are your hosts, Savannah Stone and Chloe Lee. There's a lot of business behind small business, so let's get to it. Thank you for joining us for our second part of our three-part series, Hiring Post-COVID. Today, we are going to talk about the interview process and what to do and not to do for a successful hire. Part of our conversation will focus on hiring practices for a fully or flex remote staff and what, if any, changes we have seen since before the lockdown that may be here to stay. Before we begin, please note our disclaimer. This is available in both our show notes and on our website and should be referred to before and or after this podcast. So let's start the conversation with this sentiment. Hiring feels like a crapshoot sometimes. (laughs) (laughs) It seems like you never really know who or what you're going to get. I mean, if you've never hired before, uh, you probably heard the phrase, you know, good talent is hard to find. Mm -hmm. And then if you've hired before and you're still hiring today, then you know good talent is hard to find. (laughs) (laughs) There are so many tedious steps involved in hiring. And the goal, at least in my opinion, is to maximize the possibility of getting good hires and minimizing the chances of bad hires. Um, I like to call it a mishire bad hire. Sounds better than a bad hire, right? Um, But it's expensive in both time and money. And because no system is perfect, I think the best that we can all do is try to lower the risk of a mishire. So when I was uh, first learning to hire employees, I I got it all backwards, completely backwards. (laughs) And ironically, um, some of my very unguided ideas of how to recruit and hire actually turned out pretty Pretty great, surprisingly enough. But of course, you know, equally, there was a number of ideas that didn't didn't work at all. But I will tell you from the start, my biggest, biggest misstep is thinking this, which now sounds a little silly that I'm saying it out loud. But anyways, uh, you know, bear with me here, people. Um, How hard could it possibly be to hire somebody into a decent paying job that's paying right in line with market value in a very defined field like accounting. Mm. Well, (laughs) (laughs) oh, silly, silly, young me. (laughs) Uh, Anyways, starting from my very first hiring attempt up to my very last hiring, um, even, you know, because I sold my company, my experience took me everywhere. So I did it myself because I was bootstrapping. So in year three, when I hired my first employee, I tried to do the whole thing myself. Then when I started getting the revenue to be able to support uh, more support, essentially, I hired a recruiting company, both um, hired one that was charging by the hour. And then I also hired one that did the, uh, the usual, you know, your pay is based on a percentage of the first annual pay, something along those lines. Um, and then I also used a staffing company for temps and temp to hire. And I've also hired 1099s directly, or I use some kind of platform or some kind of middleman um, type of company to actually hire 1099s. So I'm pretty sure I pretty much covered the gambit of options out there when it comes to how you or where and how you get your next hire from. Yeah. So from all that, I will boil down to the fact that I learned two lessons I want to share with all of our listeners here. One, there is a difference between sourcing and recruiting. And not knowing the difference is a very costly mistake. And then two, hiring takes a lot of time and effort and probably more so than what you anticipate. Um, So that all goes to say that acquiring a employer staff uh, or the acquisition cost of an employer staff is very high. So you want to start on the right foot by making sure you're crystal clear about the position that you are hiring for and the type of person you want to fill that position. So to get started, 
Um, I would say that um, when most people thought about hire, uh, recruiting, or rather recruiting like I did, um, you th- kind of think about this. You think about posting on a job board, then somebody applies for the job. You get the application, you get the resume, you screen the application, then you reach out to the candidate, maybe do a phone screening in there, and then if you review their resume and that looks like a fit for the position technically and their phone screen comes off okay, then you call them for an interview. I'm sure during COVID, these interviews were done on Zoom or some other kind of video conference. But I think in the past, people also came in the office to actually do these interviews. And then once the interview process is over, somebody decides whether or not that person should be hired. So what I learned was within that whole entire process, part of the job is actually that of a sourcer and part of it is that of a recruiter. And in some companies, these two roles are actually filled by two distinct people. And for good reason. So a sourcer is actually somebody who focuses on finding new candidates. They verify their interests, and then they make sure that they qualify for the job. Those who do sourcing are actively finding these candidates and uh, filling in for positions when it's needed and when it's not. So they actually keep a pipeline around of qualified candidates for if and when a position opens up. Now, things that sourcers do can include the traditional posting on job boards or platforms, um, attending job fairs, creating referral programs, right? So for people internal in your company to actually refer other candidates to the company. But they also do um, other things beyond that. That's probably a little bit more reminiscent of kind of our new world now, which is using social media to help spread the word about how great the company culture is or upcoming job opportunities. Um, And they also use um, online platforms to scout for what we call passive candidates. So these are people who probably have great experience and are a great fit for the position that you have open, but they're just not actively looking for a job right now. So that means they're either employed elsewhere or just simply doing something else besides looking for a job. So a sourcer will actually reach out to these type of candidates to both peak and gauge their interest. Um, they're the ones that does the first review of a resume. Um, maybe they even do some phone screening if that's part of your process. But all in all, what they do as a sourcer and sourcing candidates is to make sure that the candidate is interested and qualified for the job before they pass it off to the recruiter. All right, so then now once a candidate is passed off to the recruiter, Um, The recruiter may do some other level of screening, depending on what's in your process, right? Some of this could be kind of like a technical skill qualification. Some people have personality tests. Um, Usually there's some other level that's in there. Or um, if not, it goes straight into the interview process. So the recruiter will kind of schedule out the interview, make sure the candidate comes in, lines up the people who are the interviewers. And then they're also involved in issuing the offer Um, handling the negotiations, and then closing the process by either letting a candidate know that they've they've been passed on um, or they got the job. And so um, there's a bunch of things they need to do now after they sign the offer letter. So I think, uh, Savannah, you might be in the same boat as me too, right? But for most small businesses like I was, uh, typically um, the sourcing and the recruiting all falls in, you know, are combined into one person, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, We just don't have the luxury of splitting it into two. And Mm -hmm. while that is very budget effective, um, there is a downside um, since if you have one person doing both, typically if they're busy recruiting, they're not busy sourcing. Right, right. And that could be devastating, right? Um, Especially in a small business because, (laughs) I mean, you tell me if this has ever happened to you, is somebody goes through the entire process up until the offer or even after they accepted offer and then they drop off. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be talking about that later, how to avoid that, so... And I think that's one of the things um, you had mentioned, too, is pre and post COVID, right? Pre COVID, this happened, but it happened pretty rarely. Um, During COVID, it happened a lot. And post COVID, Mm -hmm. it's happening still um, Mm -hmm. in high volume, right? So Mm -hmm. when you uh, keep these two roles together, and now, you know, that one person is busy recruiting and not busy sourcing, what happens is when somebody drops off like this, you have to go back to square one and start the sourcing process over again to kind of move on to your recruiting process. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's pretty devastating if you're a small business. Now, if you keep these two roles clear and separate in your head, 
then you may have a better way of planning of how to keep the sourcing going while your recruiting process moves ahead. So yes, even if a candidate does drop off near or around the time of the offer letter being issued or signed, it may be frustrating, but it doesn't mean that you have to start over in square one. Mm -hmm. So um, Savannah, I know that uh, later on you and I are probably going to, well, you are definitely going to be sharing uh, a couple examples and a couple of ways of setting up the hiring process. And I know mm -hmm. that we'll probably be talking about kind of our own experience and what we've done like in real life. Yeah. And it'll probably help give our listeners some ideas of how to do it on themselves in their own work, I mean, in their own companies or um, in-house or outsourcing it to somebody else. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. A lot has changed in the past uh, two years. So I'm, there's so much to talk about. <laughs> there is so, so much to talk about. Exactly. Right. So um, I'm going to kind of move on to kind of just the second point really quickly, which is um, being crystal clear as to who you want to hire. So this goes back to that good old saying we hear all the time, which is getting the right people in the right seats in your company. Right. And to do that, you need to define what the right seat is so that you can actually find the right person to fill it with. And that starts with a realistic and well-defined job description. You see, oftentimes uh, we want somebody who can do a highly technical job, but also possess all the soft skills that are rarely found in a personality who can do a highly technical job. Mm -hmm. We all wish that we can hire that well-rounded person who is well-spoken, a team player, self-starter, entrepreneur, cares for the business as much as you do, and also be highly effective in what they do technically, which is also something that requires a lot of attention to details, has patience to follow all your processes to a T, and takes complete ownership of their work and contributes to the company culture. <laughs> so basically you, <laughs> but like another one of exactly you. Exactly like you. That's pretty much what you're trying to hire. Yeah, I would like a, a that's what I want to see. I want to see a job description that says, I would like to hire me, but not me, you, but me. <laughs> so I want to see one of those. If anybody has one of those, please send it to me. I want to see it. Mm, exactly, right. Or a clone. A clone would be great. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, I'm not saying that you can't find somebody like that, right? I'm sure people like that exist, but the truth of the matter is they are in high demand and low supply. And you have to know that you are limiting to yourself to a teeny, teeny, teensy, tiny little pool of qualified people, which means that you are essentially just extending the time it takes for you to fill a position. Mm -hmm. Usually in a small business, you hire when you have the need, right? So that means that there's usually one or many projects or clients that are coming aboard soon, which requires the support that you haven't hired for yet. So time isn't always a luxury when it comes to hiring, especially in small business. So be realistic when you're putting together your job description. At the end of the day, it's about putting the right people in the right seats. If you know your industry, and that somebody who is highly technical in your field usually enjoys a focused and quiet work schedule, then maybe it's not a good idea to put them in front of customers and expect them to do customer support. <laughs> Just a thought. <laughs> so that's all to say that it's a balancing act between structuring your company with a position that allow you access to the right pool and the right pool size that can keep feeding your company with the right type of talent so that you can keep growing your company. Yes. Yes. Yes to all of that. Uh, because how we do business and how we hire, I feel, has forever changed since 2019. Although I have to say it has been a long time coming as you referred to it earlier. You know, this isn't an overnight um, experience. Um, I don't know that the pandemic changed how we hire, but accelerated growing trends at warp speed, making it seem like an overnight change. Many companies have been hiring remote staff or staff members for a long time, my company included, but so many more were not on board with that idea. And then the pandemic happened, and so many companies, companies didn't know how to translate what they do to a fully remote staff. Couple this with the evolution of labor itself, and you have a perfect storm. Speaking to the evolution of labor, I feel like two major things that were slowly changing, and then the awareness of these things accelerated due to the pandemic, are skills and expectations. 
And, and when I say that this has been going on a long time, I can say it's part of the reason why I started my own business. And that was in 2011. And I was feeling this in the 2000s. So it's a long time coming. Skills have been evolving for years. And as technology and our world has grown, so have the jobs. They've become more faceted, more layered, and harder to define to a role. And saying that, the more skilled a person becomes and the more layers they have, the more they're going to expect from their workplace. So basically, we've been evolving into rainbow unicorns, and these rainbow unicorns expect to be treated and paid accordingly. <laughs> That's such a good word for it. That's I mean, right. they are. Unicorns. They're not just unicorns, though. They're like freaking rainbow unicorns. So <laughs> to, put a, to put a marker here, I'll return to our evolution has also created a wide world of finding these rainbow unicorns. We no longer have to hire locally. We can hire nationally and find all the rainbow unicorns accordingly. But then that creates a whole new set of dynamics when it comes to regional differences in communication and culture. But I digress. I'll say that there are many types of businesses that just could not be fully remote. I get it. It's due to the nature of their business. I fully understand that. But many of those companies did have to hire someone to work remotely in perhaps a support role or whatever other role was needed so that they could keep the lights on. It's more important than ever to convey to a candidate that you're the right company for them, even though they don't get to experience exposure to your space. So how do we translate that into the mind of an interviewer, the subconscious mind of the owner, and reflect it back to a candidate that may not be certain your company is the right fit? Before I begin sharing my very sage advice, <clears throat> keep in mind that these suggestions work with both a remote staff and an in-house staff. The changes that have happened since COVID are both physical and emotional. So when seeking out candidates, know that even if this is an in-office position, this candidate may have worked from home at a point or throughout and has a very clear idea of what they now expect from their workplace. Keep in mind that the overall theme here is that you need to convey to all potential candidates that your company offers a value proposition. So what does that mean? What are the attributes your company offers that can be the most attractive to candidates? Today's candidates want flexibility, autonomy, and an overall positive experience where they feel supported and confident in their role. This is going to present itself in the posting, the interview, and throughout the onboarding process. So if you haven't focused on that in the past or made it clear in the past or don't even really know what the value add is, start considering how you can change or pivot your articulation to make it clear. Now, the posting itself must change as well. No longer are we looking to hire someone with certain qualities. Now the focus is on the skills needed for the job itself. This is a relationship and can be approached, don't laugh, like a dating profile. You have to convey that your company not only cares about its employees, you care about their community, their family, who they are as a person. People want this. They've spent two years thinking about this, about how much more money they want rather how much more they want from life, how much of their job is their life. And when those two worlds converge, you have, from the eyes of the employer, a person coming to you with more than what they get paid in mind. They want to know, are you offering benefits? If not, what other value adds are there? Will you give them autonomy? Will you let them flex their brain, brain muscles? Will you care about what they care about? This has to have so much more to do with it than the description of the job. Consider including testimonials, either recorded or written, either in a post, if it's allowed, or send a YouTube video to the applicant when introducing yourself and requesting a preliminary interview. I myself have, uh, have these testimonials in my actual website. So if a candidate ever goes on my website, they can actually see what people who work for us say. When you've had an opportunity to interview, make sure your online presence shows you're trustworthy. Clearly illustrate your culture 
and helps con- and it helps candidates visualize themselves as members of your team. Explain the level of flexibility you offer and if possible, give them a glimpse into the typical day of most of your employees. All right, so now I'm going to talk about the dirty elephant in the room. <laughs> Job hoppers, <laughs> job hoppers, and the ones that are looking to leverage you, you and your offer against another. Sadly, because so many companies don't understand how the culture of labor has changed over the years, the response to that has been a movement employees that see you more as a step than as a stop. To weed out job hoppers, the Harvard Business Review suggests you ask very pointed questions when looking at the resume. And at each job, or each job, ask two questions. Why did you leave the position? And why did you take the next one? And by asking the candidate about her current position and what she's looking for in her next job. You got to listen for patterns. Is she consistently negative about the places she worked? Or her bosses? Or colleagues? Does she consistently change jobs looking for more pay? More responsibility? Once you know a candidate's reasons for changing jobs, the question you need to ask yourself is, what does that behavior pattern mean for me and my team? So let's say this person is stellar and you really want to hire them, but you're uneasy about their work history. The Harvard Business Review suggests you ask the candidates to commit to a reasonable length of time in the job. It almost always works. Your pitch should go something like this. You are one of the top candidates for the position on my team. But looking at your work history, I'm still concerned by the number of positions you've had in the last few years. What we're looking for is someone who can make a commitment for three years while our organization makes major changes to our products and services. Do you think you can make a commitment to our team for that length of time? If the answer is a quick yes, you may have found your employee. But if they hesitate, you may want to pass, no matter how rainbowy this unicorn seems. <laughs> <laughs> no. All right. No. To those that leverage your job offer, we have heard it so many times. Heck, I've been a victim of it more times than I can count. I did make changes though, which is what we're going to we're going to talk about later. But you spend the time interviewing all the wind up to hire a person, and then they come to you to say they've decided to accept a different offer, sometimes after they've already accepted yours. Ebrary has a fantastic article on this that we'll have in our show notes. And the Harvard Business Review uh, will also be in our show notes. Um, In this, it says that from meeting one employer's, rather, excuse me, in this, it says that from meeting one, employers should discuss the possibility of a counteroffer. What is your motivation for leaving your current company? What are the three criteria you're using in selecting another company? What would have to change at your present company for you to stay there? With such questions on hand from initial interview rounds, you'll have a firmer grasp of the possibility of a candidate's counteroffer acceptance. In addition, before the offer is extended, it becomes time for a resignation drill. Remember, a counteroffer is nothing more than a variable that you should seek to control before offering someone a position with your company. Therefore, part of your offer negotiation will sound like this. Uh, Bill, we've talked about your readiness to make a move from your current company but I don't want your emotions at the time of the offer to cloud your better business judgment. Let me ask you this. Tell me about the counter offer that they'll make you once you give notice. If you give notice to your boss right now, what would she say to keep you? This query mentally prepares the individual to deal with the counter offer awaiting her. This way, when it comes, the candidate may say to herself, oh, this is what my new company already warned me about. If on the other hand, the current account, uh, sorry, if the, on the other hand, the current employer doesn't make a counteroffer, then the candidate who, because of your prompting, is preparing for one, may feel disappointed that she wasn't pursued more aggressively. This is only going to reinforce her conclusion that accepting your job offer was the right thing to do all along. In either situation, your pre-closing drill will have to set the stage for a smooth transition out of her present company and into your organization. So in saying that, um, let's talk a little bit about what our real life experiences have been, how we've evolved and um, how honestly, like we've made some changes to both get and retain good 
good people, rainbow unicorns. <laughs> <laughs> we all want the rainbow yeah. unicorns um and i'm not saying that anybody needs to give up their wants for a rainbow unicorn but i do think you have to do that a little bit cautiously because i think it's you know it's it's certainly something i did in my business and i i know that i paid for it and a lot of time and effort and re-recruiting so you know find the right balance that's all i'm saying there right when it comes to my experience, like I said earlier, I, I've, I've, I've tried it all. <laughs> um, but uh, what I ended up with that is the more effective, um, both in, well, all in time, money mm -hmm. and outcome, is that I ended up outsourcing the sourcing part mm -hmm. of the process. And then I kept the recruiting part closer um, in-house or closer to my best. That's not to say that I didn't have success with staffing or recruiting companies. Um, they were very helpful in a time in my business when I was growing fast and I simply didn't have the time to learn the process but needed to fulfill the work for oncoming new clients and projects. But once I learned the process for myself and tweaked it to my needs, um, I found very little benefit in time, money, and outcome um, to using a staffing and recruiting company. I did, however, have an outsourced HR consultant on staff. She was uh, essential in keeping us compliant with the laws, <laughs> lots of labor laws out there, uh, especially when it comes to hiring. Um, she also advised us on our recruiting process. She trained me and my staff on how to be a part of our interview process. And she herself was also part of the interview process when I was bringing in kind of high level uh, management, management level candidates. So what I ended up doing, so I'll just share with all of our listeners here, is I ended up leveraging technology to really do my sourcing. And I took the lead on the recruiting process. I relied on ZipRecruiter um, to not only post my jobs for me, but I also used kind of their engine to directly market to um, candidates on a repeated schedule of certain demographics and locations. And then I also used a platform to basically do my qualifying process. And the quality prior process was pretty easy to set up once you get to it. You just set up a list of questions and requirements that the candidates have to complete as part of their application to your job posting. And if you set it up properly, it can help you kind of gauge the interest of the candidates. And then um, to do kind of like an initial qualification, like a really uh, deeper qualification, um, I asked the candidates to actually send me a one minute video to tell me about themselves. Now, I intentionally did not specify the method in which they had to use to make the video and how they were able to send it in by email, because that was part of the instructions, um, knowing that a video file is usually too large to send in by email directly. Now, I did this because it it was a test. In my company, I wanted everybody to be technology proficient or can find answers to any technology roadblock themselves. And since we support our clients remotely, and this was even pre-COVID, I wanted to make sure that our people can present a professional um, out outlook um, when they're on camera. So this one stop actually helped me weed out a lot of candidates who either didn't want to do that step, missed the instructions, or too lazy to do it. Actually, I think I had a couple of dignified responses in email, like, how dare you ask me you know, to video myself and send it in? <laughs> and then I had a couple of people who were like, I don't own a video camera. Apparently, you don't own a cell phone either. <laughs> oh, man. So um, the great thing about using a platform to do my sourcing is that I could keep it running, right? I can keep the sourcing go going even when I had candidates in my interview process and even after they accepted the offer. Because like I said, I didn't want to start from square one if somebody falls through, especially at the last minute. And then think about this. Even if you didn't have an immediate need, you simply never know when somebody's going to turn in a two-week notice. And again, two weeks if you're lucky, <laughs> right? There are some people who doesn't even have a two-week notice. They give you one-week notice. And um, I was actually on the way of executing like a growth strategy, uh, which means I was onboarding new clients every single month. And I didn't want any setback due to a change in staff to slow down the growth of my company. So I was really serious about closing the gap between losing somebody in my staff and getting a new person up and running and doing client work as quickly uh -huh. as possible. Actually, I had a staff member give me a one-week notice during busy season, which for all your accounts down there will know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> oh, I, well, you know what I've been through, so I will, I will wait until you're done. 
So I would just say that um, while my my staff members were probably my greatest delight of my company, they were also the yeah. greatest heartache too at times. Um, especially the ones that you know for whatever reason. Um, and sometimes it's it's sometimes it's unavoidable. Sometimes it's a family thing that comes up. Anyways, when you have people, there's just a lot of last minute things. And I would just say that as a business owner, you just want to kind of you know protect yourself because your your goal and I guess your job is really to protect the entire company, right? So you find ways to be be able to to do that. And you know, kind of what they say, um, hope for the best and prepare for the worst. That's one way of saying it. <laughs> yeah. So I didn't get a chance to actually evolve my process beyond that because it was working really well. But of course, as your company goes through different levels, um, you do need to evolve the process. Now, I ended up selling a company during this time, so I never got a chance to do this. But just to kind of share my thoughts, if I didn't sell the company, what I would have done was I would probably have added all the candidates that were I was sourcing through ZipRecruiter into my CRM. So we had a CRM and it's a great way to feed it right through the CRM. And it's it's kind of an automated way to almost kind of keep in touch with these candidates. Because again, you know, they'll go job hunting, they'll go job searching, maybe they'll get another job. But using a CRM to kind of keep touch with them is a way of kind of nurturing them and keeping them in their pipeline so that you're top of mind for that moment that maybe they're thinking about getting a new job and boom, there's your email. And they're like, huh, maybe I should apply there. What kind, what, when you're putting them in, in your CRM, are you making them a part of a, a newsletter or are you just reaching out to them to say, Hey, how you doing? Just thinking about you. Like what, what in what capacity are you putting them in the CRM and utilizing it? Yeah. So honestly, um, again, it depends if you have somebody doing it or you're running yourself and what time you have. But ideally, what I would do is I would treat them just like our customers. You know, I would create maybe like a separate newsletter that speaks directly to the candidates, letting them know about your company culture, about new things coming up, you know, just kind of things to keep, let them keep in mind that your company is relevant. Similarly, I would do that using also social media posting to kind of boost up people's awareness of what our company culture is and upcoming opportunities. Um, LinkedIn is a great place to do this. I see other people do it all the time. But, you know, whatever whatever social media platform you're on, whether it's like Instagram or it's, uh, 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 I was about to say Facebook, but I guess Meta, it's just a great idea, again, to keep that awareness. I mean, I think recruiting your uh, employees and recruiting your customers is really two sides of the same coin. You know, you adjust things and you're able to do exact to get exactly the same results. Okay, so then you know, outside of using like a CRM and social media for the posting, then eventually I will probably hire someone to administratively help me keep up yeah. the paperwork. Yep. Right. So like doing the offer letter, getting them back, following up the candidates, and then more importantly, kind of keeping the new employees warm between when they receive their offer letter and their start date, right? Um, I think now it's probably more important than ever, especially with the, in light of like the new employee uh, yeah. pattern mm -hmm. of behavior, which is to get counter offers and then also like jump ship or ghost you, whatever. I think having that human touch in between is really key to kind of lead them mm -hmm. up to their start date. Now, as the owner, um, I think I would be involved in the interviewing process along with my HR for those like management level hires. Um, and then for my current staff to be involved in like entry level hires. Like I always like to have somebody else outside of myself to do interviews and certainly would keep it that way. But then at some point, I'll probably hire either in-house or outsource the recruiting work. Um, but keep leveraging technology for the sourcing purpose. And I'll eventually kind of, you know, back out of the actual recruiting process. But, you know, I think you can get a get to a pretty big company and still as the owner be at least a portion, yeah. like at least do one interview. It could be a final interview or something like that. But, you know, having the right people in your company is so key, especially in the beginning. Uh, you know, that's why I was like heavily involved because you find the right people, you build the right uh -huh. company too, right? And so I think eventually I'll probably back out, but I think I would have to get to like a pretty decent size before I would be like, or at least, you know, maybe back out of entry level, like job interviews um, and only focus on like the executive well, management level interviews. But well, I don't know. I don't know that you would want to. So because I say this because so when my husband got his job here, he mm -hmm. at that time, I want to say the company he work, works for had 1500 employees. I mean, sizable, right? That's sizable. Yeah, sizable. 
um, his final interview was with the owner of the company. Yeah, you know, and I only say that only in hypothetical because clearly I've never had a 1500 person like No. And and I will also say that there's a board, there's it's not like it's just a family owned business. Like there's a board, there's like the CEO, there's a president, you know, so it's a it's a well fleshed out company. The owner of the 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 CEO is the one that um uh interviewed okay. him. Well, kudos to them. I mean, I think like I said, like because I've never actually been at that size or at that point where I, I feel like I have to make that decision about where my time is spent. I guess all, all I is to say that I can see a point where you could back out, um, but it, it, it's just it's so important to get the right people, right? So I, oh, for sure, it, it would be a very long time before I backed out of that yeah that role. Like I would always want like some small involvement with the hires of 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 my company. Well, and I think that being involved, and I will also say that at the time when my husband was, my husband was coming in on a lower level position hmm, at that time. It, it wasn't a, it wasn't a C-suite. It wasn't a white collar job. It was a, it was the low, it was a lower level job. And all, every single person went through his office before they got hired. Well, that's excellent. I, I mean, yeah. I really and. Right. right. And it's still, it's still done that way today. This was 15 or so years ago, still that, done that way today. And it was done like that 60 years ago when they started the company. And that explains why they're still around. <laughs> they're still around. Yeah. But I do think though, that seeing you, the owner of the company, even if you were to grow to, you know, a couple hundred thousand, even seeing you humanizes you. And it creates the psychological connection between you and the person that the candidate, and now they feel not obligated isn't the right word, but they they feel uh, beholden. Yeah, there's a connection. Now they're connected to you. They know you. You've spoken. There's a face to the company right now, mm-hmm. right? Just a large large machine um, turn work. I agree with that. And at, at the same time, too, I think the one thing I would say is besides the owner being involved, I found out the importance of having other people involved in the interview process, right? So the players and just also the various perspectives. And of course, you know, be strategical and who you want involved in the, not everybody, not the entire company needs to be involved in the interview process by any means. Right, right, right. But be strategical about it so that you're getting good feedback and making sure that who you hire is the culture fit because, um, I think you and I have definitely talked about this in various episodes at this point is that getting the right person and that culture fit is just so key. And one bad egg can really topple that over and, it'll, you know, cause you a lot of time and heartache to try to build back your culture. Um, For so sure. I think it's always important to have other people also involved um, in the interview process. Which is great uh, advice that you gave to me when I was struggling with hiring. Uh, I think over the years, you had said to me um, m- on multiple occasions, plus other people have said to me, wow, you, you got such a great hiring process. Oh, you do so great. And I'm always like, yes, I do. I do great. I am such a great, look at how great my company is. All the great people that work for me is, this is so great. Look at how great and I am. Here I am on the other side, like running into every single wall possible, literally like hitting every single wall possible. And I'm just looking at you going, oh, how do you have it off? How did you do that? And then... And then I don't know what happened. Like the season of change happened. Uh, It was like September and I went through candidate after candidate after candidate. I'd make an offer, they disappear. I'd make an offer, we do the training, they disappear. I I was like, what on earth is going on? I had one client that... This poor client. Thank God she's still my client. She understood because they were going through the same exact thing. I had one client who I had to introduce to five different service providers. <laughs> and and mind you, she started with me in Nova- Thanksgiving. And her final, her fifth and final person was introduced to her in uh, February, end of January, beginning of February, something like that. So in that very short period of time, she had five different service providers. Yeah. I'm like, oh my gosh, I didn't know that this is embarrassing. What is happening? And I realized it just kind of like smacked me in the face. All right, well, if I'm if I have found myself, and I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna put this in the most layman, real, real. This is a real, 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 real way I can. 
if I'm walking around my neighborhood and walking my dog at at three o'clock in the afternoon and thinking, I don't ever want to lose this. I don't ever want to lose what I'm doing right now. Or, you know, at the, at the height of the pandemic, when it was, you know, our world had shut down and I was making, you know, chocolate chip cookies with my teenage son and thinking, I don't ever want to lose this. How could I ever go back to the way it was? If I'm thinking that, isn't everybody? Isn't everybody thinking that? Everybody is. So I had to start reconsidering how I hire. Thankfully, after I changed my hiring process, um, asking more pointed questions, uh, making it clear who we are and what we do and what's important to me and making sure that we align, uh, taking myself out of the hiring process, which was the recommendation of yours, taking myself out of the hiring process and then adding, so if I were hiring, let's say if I were hiring a bookkeeper, a bookkeeper would be part of the onboarding with me. You know, so they're getting onboarded by somebody they're going to work with, or at least works in the company with them. This is an opportunity for them to engage with somebody else that's working for us, not HR. I mean, it could, it could be HR, right? But my company is just too small for that. It's, it's not with an, a person that they're never going to, in a different department, that's not going to work with them. It's getting onboarded with somebody that's going to be in the trenches with them. Now, are you actually still in the interview process or because you're talking about this is onboarding? End of it. The end of it, yeah. Oh, so this at the, the end, end of, of the interview process. Got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, sorry. I so there's the mention onboarding. No, I was like, oh, that's after hiring. No, yeah, 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 yeah. So un unbeknownst to me, I had broken it into three different just because of time, because person would come, person would go, person would come, person would go. We're going through holidays. I had gotten really sick. I had my knee surgery. I had and tax season and holidays. Just and 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 and. So. I, unbeknownst to me, had already broken it into, into three different people taking this on. But what was unbeknownst to me is that that was the secret to a, perf to a great hiring process of which you already were doing. There, I did have somebody else sourcing. I had one of my admin just doing all the sourcing. And then I had my uh, client relations manager doing the recruiting part, the first interview, um, the background check, you know, like all of those things. And then during the onboarding, it's myself, the client relations manager, because everybody's going to deal with her. She's the conduit between the client and the service provider. So it would be me, her, and then whoever it was. If it was a bookkeeper, I was hiring a, then a bookkeeper. If it was an HR, then it was an HR person. You know, somebody that was there that could also answer real life questions like, oh, do you ever have a client that does blah, blah? I mean, there's sometimes I don't know all of the things that are happening with a client. So they could answer that. Yeah, sometimes they do. They'll come to me. They won't go to Savannah. They'll say something to, to me about it. And I'm over here like, do they really? <laughs> but, but, you know, that's not an answer I can, that's not a question I can answer. So when I broke it out like that, bam, I found, I found the secret. I found the way. Like I said, it's, a, it's always evolving, right? And it's going to evolve as your company grows. But knowing that there's a, a place in which you should be, and it's not in all of the places, it's a, there's a certain level at which you should be at. And then on top of it, asking, asking questions that are very pointed to the position. And then, like I mentioned earlier, definitely click on those links in the show notes because uh, the eBrary was, was, was great in articulating what kinds of questions to ask to both weed out a job hopper and also to um, weed out a, a negotiator, somebody who's using you to negotiate a different, a different job. So definitely check and click on that link. But you know, between those two, uh, those questions are very pointed, but also making it clear from the beginning who you are, what's important to you, and what kind of an experience they're going to get by working for you. Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, and that's the one thing too, you know, the experience you're going to get by working for you. I think in the last episode, we talked about how people are now looking for experiences, Right. I mean, yes, there were people like that before too, right? Who were willing to take, who were willing to be able to balance the amount of money they receive with the experience they have, meaning that, you know, the things that people used to, you know, value to essentially make more money is not what they value anymore. It's not about all about making more money. Um, kind of like what Savannah, you had, I think, pointed out in the last episode, it was just about the experience and, you know, what, what your company stood for, what your company culture was like. You know, a lot of this that, 
traditionally was never something that was evaluated during, you know, getting a job. And yeah, that being said, too, um, the greatest thing you can do is show that. And not only can you do it through the social media, don't forget, your employees are great ambassadors for what your company mm-hmm. culture is. Yep. So if your employees are on social media, and uh, they probably all are, <laughs> you know, encourage them, you know, it, again, you know, don't make them because that's unrealistic. And that's not nice. But you know, encourage them and remind them that look, if something's going on in the company, if we have an event, if we have a team building, if something really moves you, you know, please post on it, tag us, you know, hashtag it properly, right? Help us get more great people like you in through the door yep. and have your employees also be an ambassador for your company culture and spread the word. Yep. yep. And uh, before we move on, I want to say one more thing about experience. Uh, I think before experience meant something else. So this is a whole intercommunication understanding. People used mm-hmm. to get jobs for experience, but that at that time, experience meant job experience. They wanted to have, they had to have, or they wanted to have a job experience. Oh, good point. Yeah. Now, like technical skills. Yes. Then. Technical stuff, uh, you know, learning how to use certain pro- platforms or softwares or programs or whatever, or, or learning how to do a certain thing. At that time, it was job experience. Now, experience means life experience. What am I going to gain in my personal life by working for you? Is the pay going to help me take my family on a vacation? Are the job benefits going to help me secure a retirement future with my spouse? Is the flexibility of the hours going to give me more time with my pets? Is my, uh, you know, so is, is what kind of an experience am I going to experience with you? So the word experience, if, if our listeners are, are listening because they're having trouble articulating And also hiring, but articulating experience, that's the difference. Job seekers used to look for job experience. Now they're looking for life experience. And it's not as though it's it's COVID or the pandemic that made the switch. It's something that had been brewing inside of them for years. And then when they were left to their own, within their own four walls, not stuck. I'm not going to say stuck because I don't know that any of us really felt stuck. I think we felt stuck in life in a lot of ways. And this was a mirror that got put in front of us to say, you've always wanted something different. Now you should do something different. And what is that different going to look like? So in each episode, we like to connect a famous example to our discussion to help you relate our talking points on a more global or well-recognized scale. Sometimes we use exact examples of either famous persons or successful business owners of today or in history. And sometimes we use examples of people who inspire us and have inspired today's discussion. Awesome. I'm handing this one over to you. (laughs) It's okay. (laughs) Um, I know I'm not the only one that said it, but oh my gosh, like how does Chick-fil-A consistently hire the best and nicest employees? Like, I don't know about you, but like every time I go to Chick-fil-A, I'm like, oh, hey, how are you? No, how are you? <laughs> you know, I feel like I walk away thinking like, man, that is such a well-mannered young adult. Yes, <laughs> right? And why is that? And I go to, and if I go to McDonald's or anywhere else, it's like, okay, thanks for the food. Mm. Which is not, you know, the food is great. The food is great in all of these places, but we have to admit that Chick-fil-A is just different. I couldn't, I couldn't find a whole lot on why your experience at Chick-fil-A is so different from other fast food restaurants in the hiring sense. But what I was able to find pretty consistently is that Chick-fil-A has a standard hiring process and they make who they are crystal clear from the very beginning. So this goes to what I was saying about putting those guidelines and parameters about who you are as a company so that a person coming in knows exactly what they're walking into. From the beginning, uh, they they only hire those that are excited to work there, who have great personalities, and they understand and accept Chick Fil A's ethos. Also, from the top to the bottom, there's a great belief and a culture built around servitude, not service. So that I was like, ah, 
I figured it out. The difference between between Chick Fil A and other fast food fast food service uh, fast food companies is that one thing: servitude over service. In a leadership job posting, it shares the guiding Chick Fil A principle: to glorify God by being a faithful steward of all that is entrusted to us, to have a positive influence on all who come into contact with Chick Fil A. This understanding is what separates a Taco Bell employee from a Chick-fil-A employee. We've added some links to the show notes to elaborate on those core principles. But what I mean by servitude is if you notice when you're at Chick-fil-A, they come up to your table and they're like, oh, do you need any more sauces? Do you need any? Like, you know, yes, of course, that's a Chick-fil-A thing. But they're happy when they say, is there anything I can help you with? Do you want me to help you with any of that stuff? Is there anything, you know, they're happy, but it's not fake happy. It's happy, happy because it's not, it's not service they're providing. They are serving you. Does this, am I making sense? <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, while you're saying this, you know, I, again, I didn't do any research on this, so I can't, I can't really speak to the details of it, but it also, it made me remember how, like, it reminds me of Trader Joe's. Oh yeah. Yes. Like you've ever, you've ever run into like a bum down employee at Trader Joe's? No, no. <laughs> you know, and it's not because of the Hawaiian shirts they wear. Like they are just like the loveliest, friendliest, chippiest people. And they just, they t- somehow just groups of them. Yep. <laughs> it's amazing. Yep. I- I'm telling you, it's all about the servitude and not the, not the service. I say that with a little tongue in cheek about the fact that it's amazing and nobody knows how it's done. But to be quite honest, it's the reason why Chick-fil-A and Trader Joe's both probably have amazing people working for them is because they have a very ironclad hiring process that they follow to the T to get to source these people, to recruit the right people, and then certainly to retain them. Yep. Absolutely. So in saying that, with each episode, we like to share either books, tools, apps, platforms, or anything we think is a great next step and connector to our discussion. So if you like our subject matter and want to learn more, you'll have a great place to start. So I don't have any books to recommend this time. Um, I do have articles that really help shape some of the discussion points we had earlier in our conversation. So I'll have those linked in our show notes. There's a couple articles that are just, you know, helpful for you to kind of think about, right? So uh, there'll be a couple of them about sourcing candidates, um, the top the top 10 most important best practices by Beanery.com. There is a website called resources, um, res- uh, workable resources, I believe, uh, dot co, uh, resources.workable.co. And they have a great article about frequently asked questions about sourcing candidates. So you can read a little more deeply into that. And then also how to re- write the best job description ever, uh-huh. right? So it's not really just about the job description, but it is kind of helpful to, you know, get you kind of like thinking about kind of what job you're putting together and what is the likelihood that you're going to get somebody to fill that? Or are you really asking for that rainbow unicorn, which is fine too, but just be aware of what you're asking for. Um, And then I'll have another, I'll have another resource in there that talks about the difference between sourcing and recruiting. And again, that's really just all to kind of help all of us business owners out there, you know, be clear about what the process is. Um, Like you, Savannah, Mm -hmm. like, I guess... (laughs) Well, I guess both you and me, I guess I just hit the crisis a lot earlier because I couldn't figure out the hiring uh-huh. process. I had to keep trying, keep trying, keep trying to come up with the process that works. Um, you um, had something that worked, hit a crisis, and then you, ironically enough, right, we all end back in the same position. So that's something to be said about how this process does work, right? Uh-huh. Spilling it up into a certain way, identifying the difference between sourcing and recruiting and making sure that you're hitting both sides of that um, to really help your business, you know, stay afloat because you got to keep hiring people if you want to keep growing or you just want to stay afloat. So um, you got to solve for that problem because um, because otherwise I I don't know what else to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Unless you really want to do it all by yourself, which you can too. There's nothing wrong with that kind of business as well. Well, but, you know, and I uh, think it's okay that you don't have a book because I feel like we have so many links in the show, we're going to have so many links in the show notes that uh, we got a lot of reading material for people, but... You don't feel like you're reading a book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, right? It, it's a lot of pages. <laughs> but I do have a, uh, a book to recommend, and it is going to be more... It, it is more HR-focused. Uh, the book is called Redefining HR, Transforming People, Teams to Drive Business Performance by Lars Schmidt. 
Schmidt is the founder of Amplify. That's an HR executive search and consulting firm. He spent over 20 years in the industry. He's a writer for Fast Company, co-author of Employer Branding for Dummies, and host of the Redefining HR podcast. He's the co-founder of HR Open Source. It was, he was named a Top 100 Influencer by HR Examiner and included in the Huffington Post Top 100 Most Social HR Experts on Twitter. He was also named a Top 50 Recruiting Influencer by LinkedIn, and he happens to be from this area in Virginia. Uh, I also highly recommend that if you have not till now uh, to hire an HR specialist, not a service, not a platform, an actual person. If you cannot have one on staff, hire a contracted specialist. If it's a service my company offers, I'm, I'm more than positive there are lots of other contracted specialists out there. It will do your company a world of good. I think that's also to say, too, that your HR specialist will also keep you out of like trouble, legal troubles, <laughs> uh, especially if you're in, uh, especially if you're not familiar with the federal labor laws or you're not familiar with your state law. I mean, it's just there's a couple of minefields out there that your HR specialist will kind of help you steer in the right track. So, like I said, like you said, actually, you know, make sure it's a it's an actual person because no, I, I, at least as far as I've seen, no platform, no uh, automated service gets you there. Like you, this is a this is a people problem. This is a people issue, and this is a people you know topic. You need an actual person. Mm -hmm. Yep, and um, I will also say that uh, one of the reasons why we have not spoken to uh, specifics is because of there being multiple and nuanced. Uh, HR or rather labor laws and compliance laws and blah, blah, blah. So we're giving you advice on um, the process. And as far as the questions that you can ask, go reach out to someone in your state uh, as a um, contracted HR specialist or a hired HR specialist. So yeah, I don't uh, think this is one thing we'll recommend you do it yourself. Um, no, no. Technical. And I will tell you too, like I had mentioned, our HR specialist, our uh, outsourced HR specialist, um, she trained both myself and my staff on how to conduct the interview, what questions to ask, what questions can you not ask? Uh, and I will tell you, there were some questions that I go, yeah, okay, I'm so glad you told me that because I would have just thought that was like, like a normal question, like, uh, what do you mean I can't ask that? But yeah, like there are there are there are things that will keep you out of a lawsuit. Let's just say that. So. Yes, yes. And so we're going to drill a little more in our final episode, and um, maybe we'll touch a little bit more on those nuances. Um, we'll see. We'll see what we can get away with. Uh, well, I have to ask our legal team. We don't have a legal team. Uh, please join us for our ne <laughs> please join us for our next episode where we will discuss. I'm I'm kidding. We could have a like anyway. Uh, please join us for our next episode where we will discuss the third and final part of our three part series: best onboarding practices. What if anything has changed since COVID, and how to be prepared for those changes. Please show us your support by following us on your preferred podcast platform, social media, and YouTube. We'd love for you to also share our episodes. All of our links are posted below. Until next time, mind your business behind your small business. <laughs>